Hey there and welcome. <clears throat> As I finish my drink. Well, gosh, we have a good one here for you today. This is resume renovation today. Uh, although we have a number of great lectures coming up over the summer, so let's just uh, give you a little bit of schedule coming up. All this, by the way, is over on my self recruiter website, right under the calendar tab, so all the dates are posted. Today, we're going to start off with resume renovation, really how you get the essence of your career down to a single sheet of paper in a very, very dazzling way that really gets you the interview. The, the job of the resume is to get you that interview. So have to be ready to change it if it's not working. Then I'll be back on Tuesday. That's Tuesday the 15th. That's a 5 p.m. lecture. And that is going to be how to create a three-dimensional sales brochure for yourself with your LinkedIn profile. So most people use LinkedIn just for a little bit of cursory information. There's my name, a couple titles, a couple companies, and there's nothing really here. That's a placeholder. Um, your competitor is going to eat you for lunch, essentially, if you don't outmaneuver them. And you have to lift and elevate your brand value. So that lecture is a great lecture on Tuesday uh, at 5 p.m. It's going to tell you all about how to really build out your background in a much more in-depth way. Uh, brochure style way that draws people in. That's how it helps close the deal and secure when they're down just to a few people for that last interview spot and your LinkedIn profile knocks out the competitors. That's why it's so important. Then on uh, Wednesday of next week, uh, that's a noon lecture on Wednesday. Uh, really, it's part two to my LinkedIn lecture called Career Evolution, Preparing for Your Career's Next Leap with Social Media Marketing. Really, now that I have a great LinkedIn profile, which we'll teach you on Tuesday, how do I use it as a marketing tool? How do I put together a campaign, essentially, to make sure I get the interviews and get the interests that I'm really expecting with my background? Then the next Tuesday, that's Tuesday the 22nd, I'll be back with my interview intervention lecture, all the secrets to really walk in the door, either literally, figuratively, over the phone, over video, whatever it might be, and understand it's your job to teach them how to select you in the interview process. We go through all of that detail, including the fact uh, that most uh, interviews these days will be over video. Uh, so there's a whole nice section on how you're really ready to be your best on video, which is critically important today. We're gonna follow that on Wednesday with the paradigm shift in job search, marketing yourself directly to the decision maker and engaging that individual. So yes, we build out a great resume. We build out an even more fabulous LinkedIn profile. We understand how to begin to use it as a marketing tool uh, so that when we get those interviews, amazing things will happen. Uh, but, but really, part of the outreach process that goes wrong for most people is the, how do I actually do it? So that's a much more in-depth lecture on all the ways to reach out what you say, what the follow-up is, and, and how to engage that individual that may not even want your call before they speak to you. After they speak to you, I'm very sure they're gonna want your call. You have to give yourself a little bit of uh, encouragement uh, to break through those fear barriers to get ourselves out in front of decision makers. The next week, that is 29, that's uh, June 29, that is a Tuesday. We are gonna do supercharging your job search. Uh, it's a great lecture. That is all the structural components to make sure you are approaching all of the right types of organizations. Really, the ones that are statistically perfect to hire you. We'll walk you through that entire process, and that is a game changer when you approach your job search that way. The tragedy that I find in job search is people think that it is sitting on the internet looking at job postings. That's pure tragedy. You're wasting 50% of your available time, it's the only resource you have as a job seeker, because about half of all job postings you see are not real in the first place. Oh, yes, they're real posting. They exist. They're, I'm looking at it, but it doesn't represent a real job that they're really ready to hire for today. And that's because those advertising spots were sold up to one year ago, and they expire, and they're use them or lose them. They just have to begin to put stuff in. The very next day on June 30th, that is Wednesday the 30th, we're going to do a lecture on charting your career transition. For the, So for those folks that would like to maybe do something a little different than you've done before, great lecture in how you take that entire background 
and you can go off and reinvent yourself in multiple directions, even into areas where you really don't have that experience. So check out all the lecture dates over on selfrecruiter.com. Just click under the calendar tab. You have everything. Now let me bring my screen up a little bit. Ah, there we go. Welcome. And as we shift over to today's topic, you know, our, our resume is, is so close to us. Um, you know, it's, it's our personal document. We're so proud of it and I'd like you to be proud of it. Uh, I'd like it to be handsome, attractive, beautiful, maybe even that's not his job, by the way, its job is to deliver you the interview. So it's not really this glory piece for your friends, family, colleagues, those people. Oh, look at my resume. Is it fantastic? Okay. A little bit, a little bit, but that's not really what it's about. You have to think about, this is the door opener. This is what should guarantee that you are selected for interview for any job that you're really right for. I'll show you how you make that change on your resume into a very, very new different format than you've likely seen before a format that works. Now let's talk about some of the real problems here. Some of the real problems today is that no one will read. End of that sentence. I have to say that a lot all the times that I've spoken at the public library kills me every time to say it, you know, that portends some awful things for our future, but what can I get from it? If I understand that people will not read, um, don't have sentences, don't have sentence structure, certainly don't have paragraphs. If I'm reinventing a client's resume, certainly not a secret that I work directly with clients, helping them to lift and elevate, clarify their value story across resume, LinkedIn, everything else, cover letter, you know, you're, you have to add clarity when there's nothing but distraction. So your resume being full of a wall of text is not going to get you anywhere. And you're going to see some examples today. You have to be ready to break down the walls. That's why this is called resume renovation. It's not okay just to put up a little paint, a little bit of fabric on the wall, maybe some new window treatments. No, we have to break it down to the studs and reinvent from this space. That's why it's called resume renovation to think about the actual challenge, you know, solving our problems is going to require a paradigm shift in two areas. One where we're normally thinking about and that's really the format. Oh, it has to be somehow different. Yes. Format, by the way, can solve a lot, <laughs> a lot. Uh, but we have to fix the story as well. And then we have to get it into a format that actually works and communicates. And if they don't want to read, why would we put a sentence on a resume? When I create a new resume for one of my clients, there's not a single sentence anywhere on the resume. Why would I have a sentence on a resume in a world where people don't read? There's no logic to it whatsoever. You have to distill down to concept communications where people can glance at it and with the right formatting, with the right formatting, suddenly it's right into their brain. They look at it into the brain, look at it into the brain. That's what you have to do today. And they have to see your entire story in one quick look so the entire thing assembles in the brain and they go, wow, sharp individual, sharper than the other people that are across my desk that are two and three pages and I can't even get through their story. So get ready for a big paradigm shift. Now we're going to have to showcase how we can be effective working remotely. Um, I have a client right now that just happened to shift to a, a new role and great promotion and great new company. And, and they had a great tenure with their, past company and many other great past companies in their past. Uh, that's why they keep getting hired for these wonderful roles. Uh, but they really didn't work remotely too much before, uh, what, 14 months ago, 15 months ago, and suddenly boom, everything remote. And of course, as they shifted to the new employer, they kind of thought that they might have an office again. You know, I'm not the same type that I'm not really looking for the office. <laughs> I'd rather stay a little more remote for as long as possible but suddenly they have to engage and build rapport and trust and, and, and uh, things with their team. And you have to do it all remotely. Although they will have an occasional little bit to do it in person here and there. You're going to have to solve the question of, can you be effective working remotely or do you need handholding or all of that stuff? Are you technically up to speed? all concerns they might have that we have to address in terms of working remotely. If you've not worked remotely before, by the way, most of us did not. It was a, it was a small percentage of the entire workforce that worked remotely before this past year, it's been closer to the 40, 50% of the workforce working remotely. That means 50 to 60% of the workforce can't necessarily work remotely. And I understand that there are certain roles where it really doesn't work. 
but for many, many of the roles within our economy and our companies and everything else, oh, they can be done exclusively remotely. Even as I, I could see from the organization my other half works for, you know, pretty big name organization, you know, pretty good sized staff. And uh, yep, last March, they, they went on a let's test out the emergency uh, work from home system on Friday and never returned to the office again. Now, those offices are still sitting <laughs> empty right now in Midtown. They're hoping to get some folks in them in September. Well, we'll see. We'll see. That's all going to depend on actual real scientific data. But concern right now is you need to work remotely. I need to know that you can be effective remotely. If you've not done it before, I don't necessarily believe you. So you may have to recast your story in a little bit different way. Maybe you've worked with offsite vendors or part of your team or, or managers or partners, maybe clients. It doesn't really represent remote work, although it does a little bit of remote work. So that could be a way to showcase your effectiveness at a distance. Maybe you've done a lot of speaking. Maybe you did training. Maybe did uh, uh, audio conference calls or video conference calls or, or spoke at conferences, all different ways to convey ability to work remotely, even though it's not really, that's a remote job. Paradigm shift, we're gonna to have to go through it. A, a fundamental change, a revolution, transformation, a metamorphosis, oh yeah. So if you haven't seen me before, John Krant, author, career coach, and speaker, resume and LinkedIn guru as well. So if you do need help elevating your brand, clarifying your story, in most cases, really solving some of the historical problems that, that may be presented on a traditional style resume. Oh, there's lots of ways to solve many of those problems. Think, think of an individual that may not have the best uh, skin or whatever, and, and they use a little bit of makeup to de-emphasize certain things or makeup to emphasize something else. And suddenly it's like, wow, oh, they're very attractive. Same kind of thing. We have to make sure that we're ready in how we present our value. Tell you more about my background as we go along today. A uh, lot of great ideas in my book. I'll let you check it out on your own. It's over my website, selfrecruiter.com. Of course, over on Amazon as well. Really a wonderful guidebook roadmap, really, for job search and all the different challenges that are in it, full of nuggets of gold. Very valuable long-term for you. Some other resources that will help you uh, how to not let your resume become resume roadkill. We'll piggyback on what I teach you today. These are available all over my LinkedIn. Just click on the articles. You can see what's over there or how to supercharge your job search or how to avoid the biggest mistake in job search. And that is wasting your time. Time is the only resource you have. Time mismanagement is incredibly uh, hurtful to getting to your goal, whatever that career goal is or whatever your job search goal is. Last tool over my over on my website itself at selfrecruiter.com, about halfway down the homepage, you can see this. You can see my full LinkedIn lecture. You can see me large or the slides large, whatever is best for you. You can really use it as a start and stop tutorial as you build out an amazing three-dimensional sales brochure for yourself. Let's jump into today. Of course, Self Recruiter covers not only this lecture, but my entire lecture series of all aspects of job search and career management. But today we're going to turn this lens toward the resume itself. You know, the idea of a self recruiter is this person that takes control, the person that manages your job search or career if we're not really looking right now. One great recruiter, essentially looking after one amazing individual, which is you. But of course, you're also going to have to be the cheerleader, the, the strategist and everything else that is involved in an effective job search. And part of that is keeping one eye on the toughest competitor imaginable. Those scary people that if you you saw they're going after, oh, they're going, they're going after the job. Oh, forget it, forget it. That person. <laughs> we can we can beat those people so easily, but they'll beat us every single time if we stick our head in the sand because somehow they're dazzling, sparkly, shiny. They draw the attention, but with a little bit of thought, planning, and effort, you can easily outmaneuver them. Uh, in the whole interview process and be much more dazzling. You know, a lot of people just like to go after the job, send the resume in, oh, that's it, and they just get the job. It really only worked that way. It doesn't, doesn't really work that way because everyone's sitting at home hitting that darn button, darn button over and over and over. By the way, I, I think it almost never says uh, apply, almost always says submit, all capital letters, until we're so submissive. It's like a Friday night waiting for that phone to ring. Oh, it's going to ring, it's going to ring. It'll be a telemarketer when it does. <laughs> This is a rut we have to get ourselves out of. Get a little drink here. 
this rut, by the way, is going to leave us in a place that's very unhappy. Uh, all these things are part of the human condition. And it's so easy when we're feeling like our confidence has gone into the shredder. We got laid off or, or we're in between jobs or maybe our current job is just no longer tolerable and we have to get out. We're in these places mentally and we have to get out there and sell ourselves. That's what job search is. Not very easy to sell yourself unless you feel on top of the world. You're going to have to go back, rediscover your story, probably even drink a little bit of the Kool-Aid to get over all this and understand that your job is to believe in you more than the next five or six people believe in themselves. That's infectious. That's captivating. And yeah, we're going to have to move away from some of the normal stuff to the more unusual stuff, the more unexpected stuff. And from out of that, we're going to get some really great stuff happening. Your job is also to be persuasive. Your job is not to sit there and go, I believe I can do this job. Really? If you only believe you can do this job, I am never even speaking to you because I need to speak to people who know they can do this job. You have to convert over to confident language. Remove the wiggle room. I think I'll be the best person. Well, I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt that's going to be the case. You need to be persuasive. I know it's very, very difficult. Why does a resume still matter? I mean, does it still matter? Aren't we in a world, digital world now? Isn't it really about LinkedIn? Well, yes and no, and <laughs> all things are involved. There's so much volume of communication channel and outreach and, 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 and searching through everyone to find the right individuals. You have to take control of the discussion about you. you have to take control how people think about you. As we try to apply all this knowledge to the resumes, we try to go back and think about, well, great to hear all this, John, but what should I do? on my resume. Well, to really understand that and how we're going to fix the situation, we have to understand the actual challenge. And you may have a little tiny idea of the actual challenge, but you don't really understand the complete challenge. So by the numbers, and yes, this part is not uplifting, by the actual numbers, uh, 1,000 to 2,000 resumes are being sent in for any decent job. Any kind of a decent job, this is a decent job, that's 1,000 to 2,000 resumes. Now, the, there's good and bad mixed into that. The good part is 90 to 95 percent of these resumes are not right for that job <laughs> how does that happen because they see a great job oh that's a great job they must have a job for me somewhere around that send in my resume so they go oh i need one of these too that's how that happens by the way happens to every single job posting so really your resume is going into a glut of all these other resumes trying to draw attention and they're not right for the job so the 1,000 to 2,000 resumes, you get that part yet, but who can read? Who can read 1,000 to 2,000 resumes plus 1,000 emails or 1,000 uh, cover letters, all the things that go with it, and do their own work? I don't, I don't know how you could think that that's possible. It's definitely not possible. No one can read all of that and come to some conclusion. So we have a problem right there, but we, we don't have a full view yet. If you're approaching a job through a recruiter, now this is an external recruiter or an internal recruiter, it doesn't really matter. If their title is recruiter, they typically work on 10 open jobs at the same time. That's how it's all structured. So it's not 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, it's 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. Who can read all of this? Nobody. No human being can read this. Come on, it's not gonna happen. That's why they're relying on that darn machine, the applicant tracking system. And until we're tagged like a little animal out in, in the wilderness, walking around the wilderness with giant plastic tag on the rear. Well, that's essentially what happens here. So if you're relying on that system to pull you out, that is also part of the problem. Didn't mention another part of the problem. Unless your intention is to secure a job within HR, in my view, you're sending to the wrong people. HR only hires HR people. They do not hire anybody else. They only facilitate the discussions, conversation, offers, and that. They're facilitators for everything else, not deciders. So the other caveat on top, one more caveat on top of caveat, and that is they don't have the background to accurately assess you. What they're assessing you against is this job description, which came down from the department somehow, Start it with a little fill in the blank formula. Oh, fill in the blank. I love fill in the blank. What do you think we should hire? A little salt, a little sugar, a little spice. No, no. Won't be seen without this. Won't be seen. Must have this. That's how that stuff gets written, by the way. 
And yet by the time that gets down to HR, carved in stone, you don't match the irrelevant items. I think they're irrelevant. I call the job posting the list of the irrelevance. That's a new word with a T and an S because almost everything on this list is irrelevant. <laughs> Tangentially connected, absolutely, but that's not a picture of the day-to-day -day of this job. And yet HR is going to rule you out without the knowledge. I think you need to get to the decision maker. Much more on that in the LinkedIn lecture. Now we have seconds essentially to capture their interest, to capture their imagination. Critical mistake most job seekers make is trying to be cookie cutter perfect. Oh, I'll just be perfect, I'll be perfect, I'll be the perfect little flower, they'll just see me, they'll just see me, they'll just pick me. They're not going to pick you. It doesn't work that way. We tend not to try to pick the cookie cutter perfect person. You know, if we do pick out that person, we're going to pay them less. Pick out number two, number three, number five. You're getting less. You don't want less. I'll take the one next to you on the left, on the right. It doesn't matter. You're all interchangeable. That's the danger of trying to paint yourself as cookie cutter perfect. Singular. You have to not only be that, but you have to somehow be different, special, exceptional. So you qualify as an interchangeable, but you're somehow elevated and different. That requires a different level of storytelling in your background. I want you to understand one more thing before we dive into the specifics of how to renovate your resume. I don't want to leave you with the impression that you're going to work for two hours on your resume and have your new resume. What you'll have is your first iteration of your new resume. And it likely might take you four five, six iterations to get to the right version. Do not stop early. I know it's a laborious process to get to the right version. The right version will open doors for you. The right version will have you walk into the interview conversation where you don't have to spend 20 minutes of the time establishing your credibility because they already have bought into your credibility. So if this becomes too much of a challenge for you, don't forget that I, I do it for my clients all the time. If you need help, all my services are over under the services tab on my self recruiter. So small changes change perception. We have to keep this in mind, but we have to go back to if we're reinventing what's your actual story in the first place. Now we don't mean from a made up perspective and we mean the real story. And most of us are so emotionally close to our journey because we lived it. We, we did the journey itself. And along the way, we either have forgotten or cast aside or, or dropped off all of this detail, all of this background because we assign some value to it that we thought was fleeting. Oh, that's nothing. Oh, that's too old. Oh, get rid of that. Okay. But in reinventing, you have to go back and rediscover all of that to be able to wisely look holistically at everything and then realize a few of those items paired with some of the spectacular deliverables in your story from your journey suddenly shows an entire track where they go, well, of course, no wonder you arrived to this. No wonder we should have you on the list. No wonder I have to speak with you. I recommend you close down for inventory. This is what I do with my clients. When I'm reinventing a client's resume or LinkedIn profile, we sit and have about a 90 minute discussion. Very nonlinear, very, very nonlinear. Really, it's a very open, broad discussion going over every single piece of the background, every single education, every single uh, uh, job itself. How did you get it? How did you lose it? You know, what did you learn? What was the transition? Uh, what else were you doing? What's not here? <laughs> really, we're looking under the bed, in the closet, under the rock. We're looking for every piece of detail so that you could figure out what it is. By the end of that interrogation or interview, yes, this one should feel like an interrogation, a self-interrogation. You're probably going to have what I have. And when I do this with a client, I have about eight or nine pages of notes by the end of that, in addition to all the material that's on the resume and everything else. And now you have to think about, well, how do I get eight or nine pages of notes onto a single sheet of paper on a resume? Well, that doesn't work. So grab a highlighter, <laughs> first step, and begin to sort or, or parse your information. Be very stingy with your highlighter. Only the nugget of gold, drop of perfume, the ruby diamond emerald, those kind of things, does it rise to the level of being resume worthy? It gets a little highlight. By the time you go through all eight or nine pages, I think you have now highlighted the core elements that must come onto the resume. Why don't you simply start with those and nothing else on the resume and it becomes much easier to work in reverse. By the way, that's the way I work as I'm working through and reinventing people. I tend to put it all into some master document, even if they have eight or nine versions of resume over 10 or 15 years, 
And then I try to get all that story to work together and then I work backward refining it until it's down to a single piece of paper that is dazzling. Close down for inventory, come away with that stuff. The rest of the things that are not highlighted then become a negotiation. Does it, does out of these eight or nine pages of notes about me, does, does it rise to that level or is it just minutia that will dilute my story? Diluting your story does not convince them. Keep your story focused and razor sharp. So yes, I have to be capable and qualified, but remember that is not why you're going to be hired. Yes, yes. They're not going to hire anyone that they do not think is capable or qualified. So I have to be that. That's not why you're hired. Why you're hired are two reasons only. Number one is chemistry above all other things, assuming I believe you're capable of qualifying. And number two is confidence in you. And the only thing that is not above that is the chemistry piece, assuming that I believe you're capable and confident. That means you have to also include in your story, even a little bit of focus on the resume about why you are interesting, what makes you tick, which could have something to do with your work life or could have nothing to do with your work life. And you have to think about how those elements come in and they just can't resist meeting with this very qualified person that is also very interesting. That's how you kick your competitor to the curb. Let's not be afraid of the interesting parts of our background. Notes all about you. We're also thinking from a branding perspective, all those things that could separate us from the other people out there. Really all the rest of that content that didn't get highlighted, you filtered through this one singular question. Is it something that rises to the level that will convince them that it's going to be the best business decision they make today if they choose to hire me? Then it potentially goes on the resume. Now, this one here, I got, I got hit in the head with a brick uh, right at one of my lectures at the New York Public Library with this one. We'll make it a little bit larger so you can see it here. A little, maybe a little bit smaller. So uh, I, I, right after the lecture, and if you haven't seen me before, this is a good example of how I typically am. I am full of a lot of energy, usually a lot of caffeine as well. Uh, a lot of adrenaline because I'm passionate about what I speak about. And right after the lecture with all of that flowing, suddenly a person comes up and goes, well, I've been told all I can expect is more of this and present it to me. I'm like, what is it? What is it? And, and right away I, I'm feeling sleepy <laughs> despite my adrenaline, caffeine and everything else. I'm like, oh, I, I better ask a question before I fall asleep. That's not going to be very good. And I'm like, oh, what would you like to do? <laughs> oh, I'd like to be in events. Wow, that's that's some great energy. Have have you ever been in events before? Ouch. You know, this is a wall of text, and all we really see from this is this giant wall of text that really doesn't do much for us. Uh, let, let's zoom in a little bit. I think we have a, a, a zoom. Oh, there we go. Nice zoom in a little bit. And really, all we see is this big law firm. Now, there are law firms, and there are law firms. Oh, my gosh, this is a law firm. Money, money. Yeah, big, impressive law firm, lots of money. Fantastic, and they hired you. But really, once you have two or three of these down your resume and this giant wall of text, you know, they look at it and they go, law firm, law firm, more law firm for you. I don't, know what you. I don't even know what you do, but there's more law firm for you. That's all that's happening for you. I am me with my background and I couldn't even see right here. It says events coordinator. I'm holding the resume right in front of me and I can't see it. If I can't see it, how do you think anybody else can see it? Therefore, you understand the problem. We have to manage perception. You have to manage how story is presented. This is the same exact background delivering. Really, what we're doing here is spoon feeding the baby. That baby cannot feed itself. These people cannot read for themselves. They cannot absorb your background. It's your job to spoon feed your background until they go, that applesauce was amazing. Do you have some little carrots as well? Mm. <laughs> you get the idea here. Right away, you see everything. By the way, you know what the client said? Well, she became my client. You know what the individual said at my lectures when I said, have you ever done events? <gasps> I'm working at events right now. Well, what have you done? I'm doing events at, at, at Heller Gallery, at Guggenheim, Lincoln Center, New York Public Library, at, at the Met, Morgan Library Museum. I'm like, oh, why don't you talk about that story? You'd be hired tomorrow. Those are A-plus venues. Well, I, I mean, I just wasn't doing that. I was doing the the RSVP, the, the catering, the venue selection, all that. Oh, uh, speaker wrangler, speaker wrangler. Who, speaker wrangler, who, who are these speakers? You know, Tom Brokaw, <laughs> James Carville, Mary Matlin, uh, uh, Charlie Rose. Yeah, sometimes we have to update those names and, and some of them have to move. Oh my gosh, tell that story and you'd be hired tomorrow. We have to think about any venue in this city, any organization in this city, 
that would love to have first class elevated events that would see one look at this background and go, oh, my events are going to become much better with a person with this type of experience in the background. So that's a big transformation going from that wall of text. Uh, yes, dramatic change. We're going to have to let go of the comfort of sentence structure. We're going to have to learn how to distill down to concept communication to make it come to life because we're a product. We're a we're a product that has to almost reach off the shelf and slap them going, I'm right here. Do you want to be the Kellogg's, Folgers, Coca-Cola, or whatever it is that you might like? Or do you want to be that store brand? You know, the store brands, I mean, a lot less expensive, a lot less expensive, but you know, the, the coloring on the label is always a little off. The artwork's always a little off. The taste is a little bit off. Oh, I like the price, I like the price, but which one do you want to be? The one everybody wants or the leftover? That's the leftover. You have to be the elevated product. That's how you create engagement, which is much closer to that type of engagement. Small changes change perception on everything. So in terms of personal branding, you really have to think of all those things that I put up here earlier that affect brand, everything that could separate you from others and think about what you're gonna do. I'm gonna bring these a little bit larger. These are a few resumes I just pulled off the internet. So careful where you put your resume. And I'm gonna torpedo some of these because once I poke some holes in what you see here, you're going to understand what I'm teaching you on the versions that I'm going to show you. I'm going to have this come full size so we can get it. Well, you know what? It's no larger with me on or off. So we'll keep it like that. So first one here, Kelly. Uh, kudos to Kelly on, on his or her name. Big, large. Obviously, I pulled the last name off. But big, large. I see it. Uh, uh, can't miss that brand. Now, I'm not sure shades of yellow is really the right choice because... You know, on screen, it's hard to look at. And when I print it out from the printer, it's shades of gray. That, that doesn't look quite as impressive. Um, but that's the only positive thing I actually have to say about this resume. This resume suffers from what most resumes suffer from, and that's a complete failure to consider information architecture. Am I supposed to start on the left and, and read part of that and then read across? Am I supposed to go up, down, and then second column? How's it supposed to work? You have seconds. There's no chance of them figuring it out and absorbing your value in the same way that you think of your value. So that's a problem there. Let's look at Julia here. Julia. <laughs> uh, now, I, I didn't write the notes that are on these. The notes at the very bottom said, who, who says the name has to be at the top anyway? <laughs> I'll say it. The name has to be at the top. I, the subtitle of my book is Changing the Rules. I'm a big believer in changing any rule that does not work for you. This is a rule you cannot change. 1,000 to 2,000 resumes, they're going to pick it up expecting the name at the top, expecting to cross down to employer, title, employer, title, employer, title, education. It's a reverse half moon that we're expecting. What did Julia give them? None of, none of what's effective in a reverse half moon. First off, the name's in the wrong spot. That causes a further information architecture problem because now I really don't understand whether I'm supposed to continue to read below Julia before going to the top. Should I go to the top and read the whole thing down? And if we actually look at what Julia put in front of their eyes, she put the only thing that is a reason I will not hire you. Dates are a reason I do not hire you. Dates are never a reason I hire you. They can only work against you. Yes, by the way, dates are expected. But if you understand all of this, why would you ever put the dates as the first thing they're going to see? Put the dates as far away from their eyes as possible, all the way to the right and smaller and don't bold and don't look here. Of course, I can't see the employers and titles and you might go, well, the employers seem to be blurred out, John. Absolutely, they are. Imagine they're not blurred out. I still cannot see them. Oh yes, I can go intellectually find them. What, in, in three to five seconds, you think I'm gonna go intellectually find these employers? Almost every single ounce of your value is determined by the employer like it or not that's that's the way it works in the modern world and we're at 90 degrees here with the windows open so yep i'm beginning to uh, spritz a little bit in my own studio here under some hot lights sorry about that almost every ounce of your value is determined that way if i can't see your your employers uh, if i don't know your employers far less value inside of my brain let's look at martin here kudos to martin on his on his uh, contact information, his brand uh, can't miss that brand. Of course, I've I've seen this format for so many years out there. 
format itself, by the way, causes a terrible information architecture problem. Am I supposed to run down the blue column or, or associate the blue column with the white column? How's it supposed to work? So it creates an inform information architecture problem. And actually, all I can all I can actually read if I step back is education, internship, and personal skills. Those are gimmicky labels. Those are not your value pieces. The only part that I can retain are the gimmicky pieces. And I'm pretty sure it was not worth 25% of the entire real estate just to put your name and contact information there. So some real problems there. We have seconds, seconds to tell the story in the way that they want to hear it, not the way that you want to tell it. So yes, we gotta be be capable, qualified at a minimum, but don't forget the interesting and tick pieces, what, what drives us. Now, further differentiation, resumes about catching or piquing their interest tends to be the first note of, of awareness about us. Not always, maybe it's LinkedIn, but tends to be resume. LinkedIn, in my view, is about closing the deal. If they're holding several resumes, they're really attracted to each one of these. I like them all. I've got one interview spot left. When they click through and jump over to your LinkedIn, it should slam your competition sideways. You cannot be afraid of putting content out on LinkedIn. You must have much more of your content, in my view, on LinkedIn that ever, ever makes your resume. And most people have done the reverse. They put all the detail in the resume, which is not the place for it. They put none of the detail on LinkedIn and then their competitor knocks them sideways and they wonder why they didn't get the call back. Let's take it a little bit further. This is really all about influence. So back to this idea of personal branding and hitting people in the head with brick, not going to work very well. Even if we zoom in, it doesn't really help very much. That's not going to solve things. It's about clarity and influence at the same time. I'm going to visually uh, clarify and distill the story down until it can jump off the page without the need to read it simply by looking at it in the brain, looking at it in the brain. So clarity of the career path, clarity of the story, and you need to influence them on the value of all your deliverables, everything you bring to the table, everything that represents you as a product. So let's go back to this, this secondary version, you know, the wall of text in the brain. Well, this is the secondary version. And you realize it's a very, very different way to create engagement, which is, of course, closer to that engagement. Um, so let's fully jump into resume renovation. There's five key areas. We're going to come back to each one of these really quickly. We've got five key areas we're going to cover. This will help you create an amazing winning resume that should deliver your interviews. Number one, you are a product two. Coming back to each one of these. Resume, the new definition. Your resume's goals, coming back to everyone, <laughs> understanding stacks of resumes and the three second test for resumes. You are a product too. And when a company chooses to hire you, they're hiring a product or they're buying a product, or at least they're hiring your time and talents and that's you. We have to think of ourselves as this product even though we don't want to think of ourselves that way. That means you have to consider the staging, the lighting, everything that affects perception. Resume, the new definition, I hope you have a pen ready for with a lot of ink in it. Going to take a lot of writing for this one here. Are you ready for this? Ready for this? A simple sales sheet that creates desire. You know, think about going into a Best Buy and, and looking at some of those very big things in the back. You know, the, the 78 inches, 88 inches, 115 inches, you know, those gigantic televisions. Maybe I'll come a little bit larger on screen here. That we don't need to be small. Uh, that's great. Uh, but, you know, unless you are single, that is not an individual decision if you like your life. So they make something called a sales sheet or a tear sheet right next to every one of those big ticket items. Glossy pad, usually double-sided, glue on the one end. Feels so satisfying to zip that thing out of the glue. It's everything I need to go home and go, my gosh, if we had this television, <laughs> I would do my weekend chores without being asked. I'd, I'd, I'd mow the lawn, I'd, whatever's necessary. You get the idea. Everything I need to persuade and sell, that's, what your resume has to become. Most of the time we are sending the resume to someone that then has to walk it down the hall, either figuratively or electronically to somebody else. And that person that's walking it down the hall that you sent it to is not great at selling you. So give them a sales tool that will help to sell you. And that is a proper resume that really helps create that desire. Ooh, I have to speak to this one. I think there's something special here. Now, resume's mission and resume's goals are very different. Mission in life is to deliver the interview. 
if your resume is delivering all the interviews that you want, you very likely don't really need to change it. If it is not delivering the interviews that you want, there is something wrong with your resume. Let's change it. Uh, now, goals, if it's going to deliver on giving you those interviews, the goals are really clear, a clear, clean, straightforward format. This is a format where the information itself is put together in such a way it literally jumps off the page for the reader in a way that can be absorbed. Oh, think of that word, absorbed rather than read. Of course, we have to clearly inform by educational background. Understanding stacks of resumes. This is if I if 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 you don't listen to John, because John's a big believer. And by the way, every single thing that I'm teaching you here today is my opinion. You should take it with a grain of salt. Maybe pitch it over your shoulder for a little luck. But you have to decide for yourself what to use or not use. But to me, if you didn't listen to me, because I'm a much bigger believer in just approaching the decision maker directly, which I teach right in the LinkedIn lecture. So I hope you're joining me on Tuesday. Uh, but or, or just watch one of the versions that's already on my Facebook or my YouTube. So so as I, as I think about this, um, if I didn't listen, I didn't go to the decision maker. That means I'm hitting one of those darn buttons, probably that submit button or the occasionally the apply button. All right. All right. So then what happens? Well, your your resume is going off toward a gigantic black hole in space called the data warehouse. <laughs> if it reaches the data warehouse, kiss that resume goodbye. Probably not likely to ever see that again statistic. Um, good news is on the way to the data warehouse, it is going to stop in front of a person. And keep in mind, they're going to stuck until they have a 1,000, 2,000 resumes stacked up. And really, your resume is going to go into one of three stacks, and it's going to be sorted in very short order. I stack up the resumes, I pick up each one, and hmm, might be somebody in here. That's a good stack. That's a good stack. Number one, number one. I love it. Love it. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe. Have to come back and take another look. Have to come back and take another look. Stack two. But they don't come back and take another look. They don't come back and take another look because I have this whole incoming river of new resumes. Why would I go back to these folks that couldn't quite convey their value to me the first time when I have all new exciting people to look at? So stack two becomes a dead end. Thanks, but no thanks. Similar to number three. Don't know why you sent that resume in, in the first place. Really off target for this job. The secret you may not like in this whole process, it's a literal three to five seconds. This is not a trainer exaggeration. You are never getting longer than five seconds before you're in one of those stacks. Your first goal is to get into stack number one. If you don't get your resume into stack number one, it's never actually going to be read statistically. They're never actually going to read your email statistically. They're never going to look at your cover letter statistically. Got to get your resume into stack one. But if you get your resume into stack one, we have another problem. If we're starting with 1,000, 2,000 resumes, there's 50 resumes in stack one. So go back to the first challenge, first question. Who can read 50 resumes, 50 cover letters, 50 emails, and do all their own work times 10 jobs they're working on all at once? There's nobody that can read that either. Secondary sorting process happens. You make it into stack one, great for you. They're going to grab your name, pop it in LinkedIn. Not on LinkedIn, out comes that resume over to stack two. Wait a minute, you're on LinkedIn, but it's one of those placeholders. There's a title, couple, couple employers, couple titles here. There's, there's really nothing here. It's a shell. Out comes resume over to stack two. Nobody likes the third example. Wait a minute, you're on LinkedIn, and it's exactly what I'm holding in my hand on the resume. Uh, out comes the resume over to stack two because you completely forgot the challenge. I am looking for you to drop the other shoe. Where's the rest of the story? Where is the further persuasion that you are the best thing since sliced bread and then my gut feeling about you is right? That's why your LinkedIn has to become the three-dimensional sales brochure much more than the resume. Tune into the LinkedIn lecture. It will help you a lot. So back to resume, one page resume unless it's two, but I hope you see I'm never going to be happy with that. There's really no time I'll tell a client it's okay to have a two-page resume. It's just not okay. That's a world where they can't see your background in one look. They can't imagine it. They can't build the narrative in their head. And they may not even see the impressive things until they get to page two, and by then it's too late. On the single-page resume, what are we looking at? Well, name which is your brand. Looking at your current or last three employers and titles. Of course, your educational background. A little bit of testing on listening here because I'll hear people in some of my lectures go, oh, John said just put the last three employers and titles. I did. When did I say that? <laughs> I said that's what we're looking at. And I realized I need to. <laughs> it is getting a little hot in here today. Uh, I said that's what we're looking at. 
I, if you ask me a different question, oh, what would you like on a resume, John? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. What I would like is the resume to be complete from the time you enter the workforce to today. Again, that's a listening test. I said, that's what I'd like. You know, if your, if your background goes back to the 1970s, I don't need to hear about the 1970s when you did get ready with those scissors and truncate a little bit. Three second test for resumes. Pick up your resume and take a look. Um, when you go to take a look, I'll tell you in a moment. When you go to take a look, you have to look with fresh eyes. Obviously, this is you, but you have to look. I don't know this person. In the time I tell you, and when I tell you to stop, just answer for yourself. What can you tell yourself about this person's value? Go ahead and take a look. And stop. And for those that didn't have their resume, my gosh, I gave you the benefit of the doubt. That was the full five seconds. You are never, that was 1,001 through 1,005. You are never getting longer than that until you're in one of those stacks. And most people look up from that exercise when I'm giving the in-person lectures and they go, oh, I can't tell you anything about this person. And it's me, deer in the headlights. So like, you need to change that. As you can see up on screen, I, I object to objectives all of the time. Really objectives, objective statements, all that nonsense at the top. We don't read a single word of that stuff. In fact, we shield our eyes. We look at the name. We purposely don't look at it. I know you're trying to influence me. Yes, I'd like you to influence them in a much more effective way. This is the same resume. High energy events planner, specialist. Oh, right away, I know who this person is, what they're about. Distilled down to its essence. Or different people, different backgrounds, campaign director, media and public relations, community liaison. You know, as our background gets more complex, we may end up having two, three, even four lines of text up there, which always represent the job you're going after, whether you've ever done that job before or not. You're not presenting yourself as I've had this job in the past. You're presenting yourself as I'm qualified for this job. And now look down my delicious resume and look at all these wonderful contributions in those roles, thinking of me as exactly correct. Of course, I have a great story behind this one we're going to give you uh, uh, coming up here. So the real challenge for you is how are we going to add clarity? How do you begin to work with this and really bring the story to life? First off, on this version, you can see she's got some inconsistencies here. Uh, uh, is it two? Is it dash? You know, inconsistencies don't help you. Much of the story is here, and yet there's some terrible verbiage here. Coordinated, maintained, facilitated, my duties, all the reasons why I'm never going to hire you. <laughs> Transfer that story all to the deliverables that they imagine they can get, deliverables you've actually delivered, and suddenly everything they imagine that they could get from this hire, they can see in you. Big game changer. So... Look at this challenge here. You've got to take this wall of text and somehow you've got to figure out how you clarify it by removing the verbiage that shouldn't be there. Reorienting the story in a way that works for you. Or you can go back to the wall of text, but I think you know how that works and it, it doesn't work very well. So I would focus much more on how am I gonna get this thing to uh, transition or transform to really the new one, the more effective one that you're gonna be after. Uh, don't stop too early you realize how I was able to get this down to a very simplified telling rather than this giant little block of, of cinder block that's gonna hit them. And it's, it's a game changer. Your resume has to instill confidence, has to open up the door, has to make them believe that so much is possible. Now this person, here's the bottom part of the resume. You know, when, you're, when you'd like to work in events, you know what's not good for your resume? To cut off Martha Stewart living off your resume. You want to work at events and you work for Martha Stewart and you cut off the resume? <laughs> I understand. It's, it says 1993. I don't want to show back to the 90s. Okay, but not everybody is 25 years old. It's okay to show back to the 90s. It's not the 70s. <laughs> and, and my gosh, this way. Hey, hey there, Tim. I see you are there. <laughs> uh, that's great, but but you can't cut off the things that, that you need. House Beautiful Magazine was cut off as well, where she did an event at the Guggenheim. Cut off European and travel uh, uh, Life magazine or whatever that is, where she did event-related things. Yes, we may want to cut off some earlier content, but we don't want to cut off all of the wrong content. Now, I promised you the rest of the story behind this resume. This is a great, great story. When I first worked with this person, which was a while ago, they had been in this role 11, 12 years. By the way, this is the new resume, not the original. They'd been in this role 11, 12 years down the Carolinas. They called me up and said, I, I, I think I need a career coach. 
I, I keep sending out my resume and they keep going, uh, but, 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 but we don't need a furniture salesperson. Okay. This person was selling contract furniture sales, you know, like a thousand desks type thing. Uh, now, I didn't know Price Modern as a brand. You might know them. I didn't know them. Hayworth as a brand, I certainly did know. But other than the words in the first line, corporate office furnishings, it does not repeat again. <laughs> it does not repeat again because I don't want to hammer home that message. What are you? A sales professional. Talk about the sales items. So this person was selling furniture. I said, well, what would you like to do? I'd like to be in hardware, software services. I'm like, great field, great field. By the way, that's a field I used to place. It is a great field. People make a lot of money in that. And I said, have you ever done it? And it's like, yes, <laughs> about 15 years ago. And that was their challenge. Their challenge was to sell 15 year old experience. How am I gonna do it? By the way, I'm sure there's folks on today's session and your challenge may be to sell 15 year old experience. Well, this is how you do it. At first, their entire resume, since it was 11, 12 years, covered the 11, 12 years and all these wonderful things. And we distilled it down to this super paragraph you see here, which then allowed us to expand much older, earlier listings, which then showed software hardware services. And then right up at the top here, over on this side, right up at the top in the positioning title, positioning title rather than objective statement, I remove all the sentence structure and I put my target. What is this person looking for? Um, accomplished sales professional, experienced extensive contracts across industries, software hardware services, <gasps> just what I'm looking for. And then they begin to look down and see $50 million cumulative sales to date, rank top 10 revenue every year since 2002, developed a strong pipeline. This is every single thing that would make the uh, decision maker jump out of their chair. And a little bit further down, they will absolutely see software, hardware services and go, I have to speak with this person. Think about it here. Every dazzling piece that elevates their brand that will generate the interest is here. What you don't see over and over is furniture, 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 furniture. Don't tell the wrong story. Put in here all the reasons they have to interview you, they have to hire you. Now, here's some tips I want to give you from the bottom of a resume. Yep, there's a whole resume on top of this one. Uh, we're down, down toward the bottom of the resume. And yes, this is one of those folks that was getting a little more mature. As we get a little more mature, we tend to want to take out the scissors and start cutting. Be careful what you cut. Don't cut off the wrong things. But in this case, we decided, well, let's let's start or stop, depending on which way we look at it. Let's start or stop your story uh, with electronic data systems in 1999. Now, EDS, I don't know if you know EDS. They're one of those employers. Every industry has one of those employers. Financial services, do we know who that is? Goldman Sachs. <laughs> Goldman Sachs, no matter what we think of them, it's Goldman Sachs. Uh, if Goldman Sachs hires you, oh my gosh, you must be special. There must be something about you. Fantastic. EDS, the same reputation. So it's a great place to begin the story of your career and the whole career is above. But then look below this, three prior employers. First off, notice these three prior employers don't have dates. One of the reasons these three prior employers don't have dates is that forces the brain to make a decision. And according to your brain, no matter what you intellectually think, this resume begins in 1999. That is the way our brain works, even though I know intellectually it began before that. So a memory peg of 1999 stuck in my head. And I looked down here at these three prior employers, which covered 17 years of extra background. I don't know about you, but just, I don't think there's too many folks on this, this session that need to be 17 years older next time they go in for interview. But look at the employers. Two of these three rise to that same level of stunning. Kaiser Permanente and PwC PricewaterhouseCoopers. My gosh, the same reputation that, that my gosh, if, if these people hired you, do you walk on water or you're a ruby diamond emerald? You must be, must be something close to that. Three dazzling crown jewels within one eye shot. Sizing is gonna come up, but I do wanna give you the sizing on these three because we have this false idea that everything has to be large. These three prior employers are probably down, the employer themselves are probably, well, I think on this iteration, probably eight or seven and a half. The titles are probably seven. Locations down to six and a half. That whole piece is three quarters of one inch. Incredibly effective. Like the drizzle on top of that very expensive dessert or the sprinklies on top of that or the cherry on top of that. Some important things there. Other things to think about. Uh, you've got to go through both. The formatting, yes, formatting will help solve a lot, but you also have to rework your entire story. 
want to give you sizing here based off this one. Betty Jo is my cousin, so I figured you didn't need all of her contact information, everything else. So up at the top, the positioning title space, the former objective uh, space, that is all the job that you're after. Clear, that's the job I'm after. You present yourself as qualified. Down the page is all the employer title and all that detail. So the first thing you do is highlight everything on your resume. We're going to change it over to a font that makes sense. I recommend Arial, Verdana, or Helvetica. They exist on every computer known to man. Arial, Verdana, or Helvetica, this is Arial. But the worst you can choose, and there's so many bad ones, is, is Times or Garamond or any of these that have little shapes or squigglies. With the, you know, you may think that that's the nicer font to read. It is not. Print your resume out in Times, print your resume out in Arial, put them side by side, give yourself three to five seconds. Clear winner every single time is the clear, clean, straightforward font. Not the little font like that. So everything on the page besides the right font, I'm now going to start it at 10 point. Everything on the page is going to be 10 point. Are we sitting down? And then we're going to go down from there. These are not for you, and we have the wrong idea of what makes readability or legibility. Of course, subtitle of my book is Changing the Rules. I'm going to violate my rule right away, go up to the name, and make it 18-point bold. 18-point bold, big, bold, John Grant, or whatever your name is, right up top. No shyness. You are the product. No little John Grant. Mm, not going to hire that person, John Grant. I like two lines of space. going to show you how you add space between lines and space between characters. Those screens are coming up. Right now, you should write down, because it's written down nowhere in my materials, you should write down the spacing. Two points of space after the name. That's before your contact line. Uh, Betty Joes does not have the contact line on it. <clears throat> but your contact line should be a single line across the whole page. You take that contact line and you make it seven point. Yes, seven point. And when it becomes seven point, it's going to go like this and be very hard to read. <laughs> and then while it's there, you're just going to expand the character spacing. We'll show you how that coming up on screens. Expand the character spacing by one, two, three points till it spreads out. And you'll realize even at seven point, completely readable. When they're so dazzled by you and they want to call you, they're going to pick up your resume and dial you because they can read it. Going down the page, your brands, the employers, those are 10 point bold. I hope you've noticed the comma location and date are not only not bold, they're certainly not 10 point. In this iteration, they're seven point. You can have lots of variety as long as you make a rule list every Employers treat it this way. Every title is treated this way. Every rest of the line is treated this way. Every bullet point is treated this way. Lots of rules, lots of variation, but consistency. You have to have a list. Everything is applied exactly the same. Now, title, I know this first one here, Good Spend Village, has an extra line right after the, the name of the company. Let's look at Salvation Army or United Way, more traditional setup employer title. So the uh, after the employer line, by the way, I like two points of space. We're going to show you how to do those. Uh, and the title line, I'd like a half a point less than the brand. Therefore, I'd like the title line 9.5 in size. Certainly not bold. That's a huge mistake. Your title's in bold and the employer's in bold. They're fighting constantly in the brain. Draw my attention. They have to work in harmony. Still needs to draw attention, so it's italicized at 9.5, not bolded. It's now work in harmony. Your bullet points have to be indented, not in line, indented. Serve the reader what they want on a silver platter. They want employer title, employer title, employer title, make it easy for them. Lure them into your bullets with what we do with the bullets. Now, each of these bullet sets, I'm going to scroll over the, each bullet set one at a time and highlight it, and I'm going to add spacing. I'm going to show you how to add spacing coming up. I'm going to add spacing after every bullet. First off, let's make the size of the bullets 8.5 in size. And when I do, the bullet set is going to get a little tight, a little tight, a little hard to read. It's already highlighted. I'm going to fix it, and I'm going to add 1.75 points of space. Just write that number down after every bullet. We'll show you how to do it coming up. So you have a pretty good idea now. What's missing in our discussion is I didn't tell you about that special line under Good Samaritan Village. Now, uh, Betty Jo, my, my cousin, moved to Florida from New York, worked for a number of big-name places up here, moved to Florida without really doing the proper research. And you know what? Florida does not pay. There may be a handful of jobs that pay, but really the, the earnings level down there is terrible. Also, the safety net is virtually non-existent compared to someplace not like New York. And until you've actually been in the systems, you don't really understand what's a, what, what that difference really is. So Betty Jo found herself down there having to get back to work 
everything else very tough. And she lands a Good Samaritan Village. Well, the problem with Good Samaritan Village, and, and I spent 13 years in Florida before I escaped, <laughs> but every second or third mobile home or trailer park in Florida ends in the word village. By the way, there's nothing wrong with working for a mobile home or trailer park. I can't have someone make that misperception about Betty Jo. This is another significant employer, the nation's largest non-for-profit long-term care organization. If the person, random person sitting next to you does not know this employer of yours, you very likely need some descriptive line to set the value. So they don't think, wow, great career, great career. Oh, right into the toilet. What happened to you? No, it's another great job. By the way, that descriptive line, if you need it, is eight points in size. And yes, it does have two points of space right after it. So think about how this is all set up. Think about your spacing, title, title things like uh, professional experience or education. I like those in seven point all cap bold, which will draw too much attention if it's all black. So you notice here, I hit it with a little bit of gray. And what happens is it disappears into the background after giving me framework. So it helps me with the structure, but your story is what comes to life. And then work on all these individual pieces of sizing and spacing that I've already detailed out for you and think about how all of that is the essence of how you remove the work for the reader. Once all the minutia of the words are gone that shouldn't be there, everything becomes easy to read. Everything is served up the way they want it versus the way you want it to tell it. Think about all the spacing pieces and let's make sure we uh, do it all correctly. Uh, let's just get over to our next screen here in just one minute after a couple more animations. In the meantime, I'm going to get just a little bit of a drink. Now, contact line. What would we like on that contact line as I wipe a little bit here because it is heating up in this room. Single line. We start out with our LinkedIn URL. Really, if they're holding the resume right now, I hope they're convinced already. So the easiest thing to get to is my phone number on the far right left to right in the Western world, easiest thing to get to, pick up the phone and call me. If you're not quite convinced, second easiest thing to get to is far left part of the line. Click on my LinkedIn profile so you end up on my three-dimensional sales brochure so I can convince you the rest of the way. In between our city and state, you don't, you don't need the address. We don't hire you because you live at 123 Any Street. Also, email address, cell phone number on the outside. That's the cell phone number. That's not your home phone number. I don't care that you can't get your cell phone number at home. It's your cell phone number. Really, really important there. Now let's talk about how we add space. We talked about adding space both between the lines and between the characters. So between the lines is really simple. I'll go to anything I'd like to add space after. I highlight it, go up into format, down to paragraph. Keep in mind, Microsoft makes many, many versions of Microsoft Word. And this is my Mac version. Your version may, make, may look differently. You may have to absorb the concept of what I'm teaching you and go find it on your version of Microsoft. But I'm gonna to go to format, down to paragraph, and a box is gonna pop up and part of that box simply says points after. And I'm gonna either enter the two or maybe after the, the uh, uh, professional experience or education moniker, I might like eight points of space before those things actually begin. Or after the employer before uh, title, I like the two points of space. Or after title, I don't think I told you this one, before bullets, I like four points of space. I did tell you about the bullets and after every bullet, it's 1.75 points of space. You get the idea now and you understand how to add space between the lines. The other thing you have to think about is adding space between the characters, like on the title or the contact line, or maybe on occasion, even one of your bullets is a just a hair too long, dip into the second line and you need to shorten it just a little bit to get it to a single line. It's the same thing. You can add a reduced space right here. I go to format down to font this time. And now a, a box is gonna pop up. I simply click advance and I can either expand or reduce my character spacing. I, I can condense it or expand it. So really in terms of contact line, I'm gonna expand it one, two, three uh, points until it spreads out nicely evenly across. Now you understand how to adjust that spacing. Three, four, five, maybe even six iterations to get to the right resume. Don't stop too early. Every single time that you Get to the new version of the resume, you put it next to the old version, what works, what doesn't, pick it up, do the three second test, back to the drawing board. It's worth it, it's worth it. Work your way to get to the very best one, just not an adequate one. Now work pedigree, mm. 
that's a strange word. We think of horses, dog food. Okay, okay, got the right word. You may get that three to five second look at the resume, but I don't think you understand the valuing process yet. We're looking at the quality of these companies, which is strictly our perception. Good, bad, or ugly, right or wrong, it's what I think of that brand, even if I have no experience with the brand. Titles and accomplishments, even though I said we wouldn't really read those accomplishments, and of course, educational background. Here's some proof. This is arguably the world's simplest resume. This is Todd Smith, Nestle USA, Director of Quality Assurance, uh, Kraft Foods, Quality Assurance Manager, Coca-Cola Company, Quality Assurance Engineer, uh, University of Florida, BS in Agriculture. If this is all that's on the resume, I guarantee you this is the world's simplest resume. And then I think everybody has an opinion about Todd's value. I mean, what can we get here? Oh, I, I, I see the career progression. I see engineer to manager to director. Oh, they got the degree. That's really a pretty good thing too. Oh my gosh, look at these employers. These are dazzling. These are great employers, aren't they? Aren't they? How do you know? <laughs> now, I never worked food and beverage. I don't know if these are great employers or not. But almost every employer is totally messed up. Uh, I have a close friend that has worked for GTE Internetworking, which became Genuity, uh, Level 3 Communications, uh, Liberty Media, Nokia Siemens Network, Cisco Systems. Every one of those organizations I just mentioned is absolutely messed up beyond belief and an internal meat grinder spitting out the parts of their employees as they, as they grind them into the dust. Um, but the perception is, wow, there's just some great brands. These are probably just as messed up, but, but maybe they're not. Who knows? But the perception is, oh, yeah, great brands, great brands. Here, here's how you prove it to yourself. You're the individual that has to hire now. You're looking at Todd. You've only got one interview spot left, one, one spot left. You get Todd, and you have this other person. And for argument's sake, they have the same engineer to manager to director. They have that same background, the same University of Florida, BS in agriculture. But what they don't have, they've done it for three brands you've never heard of. There's a million food and beverage companies out there. Let's see, is it Todd or the other one? Todd or the other one? Who gets the interview? There's no discussion here. Todd gets this interview every single time. Now you understand the power of brands. You also understand that value, value everywhere, but nowhere to be seen. A resume with nothing on it, you felt value. Where you're going to lose is what you put under those employers and titles. So make sure your achievements are bullet pointed for easiest absorption. Lots of tangibles, deliverables. Just make sure it's not minutia diluting your story. So yeah, we've got to focus it on these very important areas, which really all touch on performance. Think about how that transforms the story. Degrees of degrees. Have you received in hand your college degree? By the way, I know it's a very strange way to ask. You know, I learned to ask that way as a recruiter when I realized people were lying to me. <laughs> you know what three credits shy of a degree is? No degree. You know what? I didn't pay that $167 I still owe the university is? No degree. <laughs> Um, you know, if you did not receive your degree, let's still go get the credit for as much as we can. Put the university or institution right there. Put coursework toward field of study, not coursework toward a BS and whatever. That is too close to baloney. There cannot be any little bit of three card Monty or grayness about your education. People think you're misrepresenting. It is over for you. Truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth. Designing your resume, well, I'm giving you a lot of ideas here, but it's really about moving your brand forward, helping people visualize your career, how it come to life in their brain, of course, absorb your, your tangibles, uh, deliverables, achievements, all that, and, of course, educational background. A word about Word. Yes, I use Word, too, uh, but, but it's one of the worst programs ever. <laughs> Microsoft really writes some of the worst garbage on the planet. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. And Word is the perfect example of it. In all these years, they've never bothered to fix it. No matter how many iterations they try to sell you, no matter how they try to move you to subscription plan, they've just never solved the basic problem, which is if you spend all this time to make your resume perfect, the way I'm suggesting, and then you dare send a Word document to someone, you have no idea what it actually looks like. So when you are all done, uh, yes, I build them in Word too, you can navigate over to my YouTube channel, watch my Headless Horseman video to understand how you convert this over to a PDF. I don't care what computer created it, what piece of software created it. Once today you convert it over to the PDF, it is locked in stone and it will look and print great from every single place. Wherever you are in your process of reinventing your background, you know, take your first step, take your next step, take the step that will eventually lead you out of wherever you are now. 
And if you need help in that process, uh, I think you know a great career coach that can really help reset your brand in a very different way that opens a lot of doors. If you do need help, Resume LinkedIn, just check out my services under my services tab on my selfrecruiter.com website. And if you need to chat before you select the actual package, you can just send me a quick direct email and we'll set up a time to talk and we'll move ahead on working together. A couple last things that will help you. Don't forget the cover letter. You have to be your authentic self. That does not mean confessional. I'm actually shy and introverted and this is what I'm doing. I don't have to be confessional in what I'm presenting. You have to be authentic. I am still authentic because this is still me too. <laughs> you know, we're very complex people. Uh, Check out my cover letter article over on the website. Just click on the advice tab and it will help you called knock, knock, how to write a cover letter that will open doors. Take us through the entire, entire structure of that process that will help you. Create some engagement and uh, really get it all going, which is of course closer to that type of engagement. Thank you guys for joining in today. Uh, join in for the upcoming lectures. There's, there's a great lecture coming up on Tuesday for LinkedIn. That's building your professional network with LinkedIn and how to use it for your job search, how to build the street eventual sales brochure. We're going to follow it on Wednesday with Career Evolution. That's part two of my LinkedIn lecture. Really, now that I have the great profile, how do I actually use it as the marketing and selling tool? Separate process. We'll walk you all through that. The following week, Tuesday, we'll do interview intervention, including all the video intervention, uh, video interviewing techniques. So you're really at the top of your game. Uh, and then that Wednesday, we'll do the paradigm shift in job search, all the detail of really reaching out, engaging, and persuading the decision maker directly. Lots of other dates coming up. Check out selfrecruiter.com on the calendar page, and we'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care. Bye.